something about this bunch doesn't smell right. They are, but they don't seem too keen to talk with you, do they? No, they don't. Glenn seems to be contemplating grievous bodily harm while he massages his raw knuckles. In the far back, Eugene is doing his best to ignore you. <laughs> and from his perch at the end of the table, Titus Hardy himself stares at you with a cold contempt that makes you want to leave the cafeteria straight away. Besides, you're pretty sure they consider themselves social democrats. Hi, Gendarme. Another rendezvous. Hello, hello. So what brings you here? Oh yes, let's see. He knocked on my door a few days after the lynching. I think he was going through the entire building, asking questions. Muscular, handsome, strong, like one of those military types. Oh, let me think. He had an accent. He sounded like one of those mercenaries. He sounded vaguely Oranese. Yes, but he was speaking to someone on his earpiece. Yes, you know those tiny speaker microphones that fancy security guards sometimes wear, just reporting back whatever I was telling him. Nothing. That I didn't see anything. What, friend? No, I don't think it came up. Sure. Anything else on his mind? Admiring the atmosphere. What about you, officer? Well, here's to you. You did? And how did you like him? I told you, he can be very useful. I guess that's the charm of powerful people. Friends, I told you. Sunday friends. <sighs> that he won't be there when times get tough, I guess. It is. On Sundays. He has keys. And he likes the view. To the sea, I mean. Hmm? What about me, Gendarme? Bye-bye, Gendarme. The clowns are still hanging around. What is it now? Fuck! I knew that fucking whore couldn't be trusted. For the record, Titus Hardy did not explicitly specify the victim as a whore. Oh, shut up and stay out of this, Liz! He raped her. He was out of his fucking mind. You have no idea. She's just in denial, asshole. You don't understand the traumatic experience. She's shutting down. And she doesn't fucking trust you. Yeah, she's crazy, you know. This is a diversion. Stay on track. Lawman, I'm at the end of my goddamn rope with you. I fucking told you not to push her. And you went and pushed her. I am gonna fucking hit you. Duh. Titus Hardy Everard personally sent me to take care of this. If this goes south, we'll all be in the shit. But you... Titus Hardy are going to be buried. Am I understood? When she's angry, she emphasizes the S. It gives her voice a strangely hypnotic quality. Look, Copper. We know that that fuck was a rapist and a killer. We got him confessing to it on tape. Show it to him, T. What's the harm, right? Here, jerkwad. Listen to this shit. And then come back and tell me the soldier of the apocalypse was an innocent man. This is their last play, this tape. Their story is in tatters. A mess. You don't care about evidence. The fuck are you a cop for then? Big T. They don't care about getting the truth. I won't be on your bulletin board. If you don't listen to the tape, we got nothing to talk about. There's a lot of questions. If you ask them now, they'll just keep bringing up the tape. Listen to it, and they'll have nothing to hide behind. Don't forget your tape, lawman. Compliments of Titus Hardy. You do that. The porter reel is just what you needed.
This isn't a rave, as you This is a fucking village. I can almost see the elephants. The harbor. That's the son of a Kvalsund crane. When this shit is done, I'm gonna tear that place up. Soldier of the Apocalypse style. Kill shit. Dogs and chickens too. Gonna run a room, Cordy. A room nice. I don't give a shit. I'm fucking done. I'm done mentally. I'll fucking do them all in. Rape that disco cunt on the counter. You know, the dance of whore upstairs. Do it Kohoi style. Never did get that taste out of my mouth. The lieutenant presses the button marked Arete on your portaria. The tape stops spinning. A village on the Samaran Isola in South Safri. Grad committed war crimes there, the kind of thing he talks about. The South Safre conflict is an ongoing proxy war between Grad and Safre. It has been hot for 12 years with the atrocities piling on, mostly committed by the Grad. Who knows? Maybe the tattoos would have an answer. We would need to know the story of this man's service. A symbol of Soldier of the Apocalypse style conduct in a civil environment. Corti could be short for Cortenar, one of the other mercenaries, the one he was talking to. Probably the mountain at the harbour gates. Mr. Right to Work, I think we've got a few more questions for class here, don't you? This seems to contradict her testimony, at least to some degree. As you take out the tape, the boombox tunes itself back to the cheery radio again. I was just thinking, what a nice day for questions, pertaining to a murder investigation. She puts her coffee cup down with a soft ring as the porcelain meets the metal table. Did he? I never said he was a good man, or that he had good intentions, only that he was never bad to me. She doesn't care. If anything, she sounds amused. Mm, where did they get this recording, exactly? It's intercepted radio chatter of the deceased, recorded via a de-encryption station. It's authentic enough. Did he say he's gonna do it Soldier of the Apocalypse style? The phrase was used. Yeah. That was practically his pickup line. Did he say whores a lot? Was he pretty much on the verge of doing it Kohali style? He wasn't actually there. He didn't do a tour, or at least didn't tell me he did. Would have been overkill anyway. He lived his own little kohoi. It wasn't his... everything. No, I'm pretty sure he did all those things. And then had to internalize them to keep on living. Until they just... Sort of turn into his, um... What's the word I'm looking for? Running joke. I was gonna say running joke. And it sounds like you didn't even get the good bits. Lely's punchlines got way, way funkier than that. He was like the Semenese conflict, the Kohoi massacre, and the 36 famine in Yezu all rolled into one person, then cast in Orani ceramic armor, which he wore in bed and in the shower. We're all scraping up any happiness we can find, officer. Going around with our little scouring sticks. You, your first love, 
Mr. Quohoi here. Did he tell you he had actually done any of those things? In Martinez, I mean? No. We were too busy laying waste to our own nervous systems to direct any of the fury outward. He seemed... He seemed happy, I guess. At ease. As much as a man like him could be. What kind of man was he? Before you go, ask for details. She seems okay to talk about it. Thank you for clearing that up, miss. Whenever you're ready. I'm interested to hear what Taito Hardy has to say now. She takes a very small sip of her coffee and smiles. Like, for example, his name? Actually, officer, I didn't know his name. I just called him Lely. A nickname? I guess. He came from Lely's dad. It's short for that. And it was his army name, apparently. He said his real name wasn't his. I tried to pry it out of him, but it was no use. Lely Stad. That's a good start. We have a few questions you can help us with. A few things a field autopsy alone can answer. The young woman cranes her neck, trying to catch a glimpse of the page the lieutenant passed to you. On it is a list of autopsy observations recorded neatly in blue ink. Everything left to be clarified is in the column on the left. Oh. That. Sure. Waterways. It was mostly for showing off to chicks, though. How? <laughs> Imagine him lying in bed. Freakish musculature laid out on the sheets. Scarred, of course. Tattoo. The sheets are dirty for some reason. Is this Oranis lit? Yes. This is the very essence of Oranis lit. A moment's respite. Dark and hopeless as the struggle itself. He's smoking and drinking, of course. And his chest and shoulders and arms are studded with stars. Tens, hundreds of them. Maybe even thousands. And the woman goes like, What was this, baby? And he says, That was too hardcore. Don't ask me about that. So she goes, Okay, but what's this, baby? And he's like, Saw some bad shit there. Killed some loincloths. And so it goes. Star after star. Port after port. Third world country after third world country. And he's done horrible things in every single one of them. Oh yeah. No thank you. I've seen enough of him dead. I can tell you what they meant without looking at them. Go on. He was a blue-eyed boy with thick arms from a small town. He was also poor, and the government of Oranya needed some people killed, so they turned him into a grotesque killer. For money. He went to Killer Academy in Vredefort. Then he killed some people on the Seminine Islands. And on other islands, too. All of the islands. After this, he came to Ravishol and got killed himself. Change of topic, perhaps? Yes. Light blue. They were like... Like little blue galaxies. It was strange, seeing those eyes in his fucked up face. Pardon the swearing. I do him an injustice. He wasn't ugly. And he had a beautiful, soft voice. Very surprising. What with all the scarring. It was quite something, watching him speak. He had a combat wound? On his chin and mouth? Yes. Severe. It made him look like half his face was cracking away in some strange smile. That and those eyes. Oh, yes. His hair, if you can remember. It was light brown. Almost blonde. He darkened it with brilliantine. Made oily. Not nice to stroke. I couldn't convince him to leave it alone. He was 42. 42? Are you sure? I would have had him above 50. He had many scars that made him appear older. But no, we even celebrated his birthday like some weeks ago. It was a funny two days. He had little reason to lie to me. We were slightly off then. Thank you for clearing it up. A miss. All right. Coolly, gracefully, she pours herself more coffee. Not my favorite topic. 
How about we, you know, change the... Yeah. It's pretty to look. It's I have no idea, officer. It is. The lieutenant makes a note in his notebook. Thank you. I've put a lot of time and effort into it. Technically, possession of narcotics is legal in Revachon, but you should still reprimand her. <laughs> what did you say? No, no. You said narcomania. What kind of word is that? Sure. Onto where? Oh, yes. One of my favorites. It cures many ailments. Like not being able to stay up for 36 hours. Not being happy. It cures those ailments. It's just a merit speed molecule, basically. Very funky. Watching herself reflected in the bedroom window, tall and sparkling and draped in smoke. Yeah, I'm wintering. How long have you been staying here? About four months. I came in November. The bills downstairs concur. Here in the Whirling, here in Martinez, or here in Ravishol? Because it's the funkiest building in Martinez. And because all the other buildings are bombed to hell. All right. You made the right call there. It feels good. Pure. I'm talking about your zero tolerance policy toward the mania of narco. You're in the right there. Powerful stance. Would you like to take it up a notch? Would you like to become an anti-narcomania zealot? Yes, you're pure, unravaged by narco. Of course not, you've always been anti-narco militant material. You kept her off a dark course with that interjection. What? Never mind. Wait, stop. That man, bloated beyond all recognition, was 42? Below the damage. The weeks of decomposition, all the swollen indignity of morality. He was 42 years old? How old are you? That's where this is going. 45,000 litres of raw alcohol has left its disfigurements. What lies beneath, you wonder? You could ask either one of them. Huh. How old do I think you are? She's buying time to formulate the best answer. I don't know. 40? I was like 9 when OO peaked. That was what, 19 years ago? I liked them when I was 9. You couldn't have liked it when you were 40. Let's say you were 20 something. 25. A good disco age. 25 plus 19 is 44. I'm gonna say you're 44. Wow. Yeah, I have a university degree, you know. Absolutely. Age is just a number, man. Yes, miss, but for him that number is 56. Wait, this requires scientific measurements. Okay, seek not the truth. Cower in barbarism, you 58-year-old man chart. The same small, heavy door. This window.
accounts are still hanging around. What is it now? And that fucking fucker. You're the worst cops in Revishaw. I gave you gold on that tape. That fucker wasn't aimed at you. It was at her. Dark. Dark is when you start a goddamn death rock band. He said he'd rape her. What did she have to say then? Fine by her. This is what people are supposed to be like. Fucking whoop de doo Yes. In fact, I think she thought it was a little funny. Funny? No good goddamn psycho whore. Seems like they wanted to give Clasia a second chance to play along. She still didn't. Right. Oh, fucking right then. I guess it's good then. That fucking... Please try to control yourself in the presence of visitors, Titus. Okie dokie. This is just perfect. Just fucking perfect. Any thoughts on this, lawman? You don't have to say everything out loud. Just mix and match. I already told you. We fucking hanged him. Come on, Titus. The stakes are too high here. There will be blood on the streets. The tribe trying remember? I know you're tired. Why don't you just... You know what? I am tired. I'm tired of you. Them. And the whore upstairs. Next time you see her, tell her. Titus said. Fuck off! That lion scamming. Yeah. On the floor, Bear drips out of the can into a small puddle. No one does anything about it. What is this quiet funeral shit? Why don't we make it 40, huh? Why don't we make it 100 beers? You're not loud enough. 100 beers? Now we're talking. Hoppity hop over here, cafeteria manager. It's you again. What is it? Convince Titus he's being manipulated. You should know by now. Titus Hardy will never falter. But you know someone who might. Fat Angus, the powerful guy. Mr. All Muscle. The time has come. Put him in the pressure cooker. Just remember, it's about more than Glasia. It's about these men and Martinez, their district, their responsibility. Outside, under the rising sun, tattered and in ruins, the windows of the cafeteria aglow with her morning light. Huh? He'll get it. Go on. Got it. Kill you. Because they don't like you. All because... Bring that up one more time, and you won't get to write that report. Yes, I understand, Alain. That's your name, right, Alain? You'll kill us. That's what they do in the wild north. It wasn't that. It wasn't... We just couldn't get him down, okay? That's it. That's the weak one. You f***ed him out. Now go in for the... Officer, 
You will be next if you don't shut up. Firearm. A Glass 08 or a 38 caliber pistol. Either is small enough for you to have missed. He's onto you. He knows what you're trying to do. We didn't kill him. We didn't even hang him. He was dead when... Shut up, Angus. Fatty! Say one more thing to the cops and I'll... Dennis, stand down or I'll beat your head in. Theo, take your hand off the belt. This isn't third one. I've got this under control. The room falls quiet. So quiet, you can hear Angus wheeze. Angie, where's your goddamn inhaler? You sound like you're dying. I left it home. I can't get it. I'm too fucked. I'm sorry. Why are you so fucking fat, Angus? Now it's all pointless. Because of you. You wasted my time. I told you, Titus. I told you, just give her up. Lizzie, your help is no longer needed here. Go tell Abroad. Fine, I'll tell him. After a long walk along the coast. You're in. He's all yours. The lieutenant gives a smile. Only you can see. He nods. You hang the corpse to cover up the real cause of death. What was it? We're not sure. Probably a bullet. The wound was difficult to see. The coroner and his assistant are wrapped in blue. Hands covered in blue gloves. Mouths covered by blue masks. Bodies by blue aprons. The coroner wipes his brow, scalpel still in his hand. Get the light. Shine it in his mouth, he tells his assistant. The coroner squats to better see the light illumines the darkness inside. Well, shit. Can't blame them for missing that. Get the saw, Alan. This just got fun. Cause the girls asked us to. They were in some shit. Girls plural? There's another girl. Two of them. Take note of this. They'll probably say more about her later. Did she kill him? Cop, I have no idea. Class J came down. She seemed really out of it. Drugged up, even more than usual. Bug-eyed and gurning, you know? Not in a fun way. It looked like she'd redosed after something went down. I've seen that look before. She was scared. I knew someone had died. I've done this job for ten years. I've seen it before. It's the politician in the motel room with the dead hooker scenario. Only in reverse. Good analogy, boss. You don't get to talk yet, Chinky. You're still on the bench. We went upstairs. Sure as day the Merc was dead. There was a bullet hole through the window. That fucking dirty sheets and bottles everywhere. He means they'd been fucking. Tibbs patched the window. And the corpse. We hanged. Nah. He's my brother. He's in the window replacement business. Tibbs. That's short for. Yeah. Good man. Bet their father's name, Atticus Hardy. Lucretia Hardy would be their sister. Anyway. You may have noticed our girls in some shit of her own. Yeah, she wouldn't. She's fucked if she shows up on police radar. They're powerful, connected to the moral intern. She's clearly afraid for her life. Says if she showed up in your systems, she'd be ghosted away. That's all he knows. That's all she's told him. And why would you help someone like that? By taking on a murder? Why would I? I guess we abide all sorts of runaways and losers here. It's a Martinez thing. Not yet. Just some ideas. She says the shot came from outside. Behind the window somewhere. So that's a clue. I'm thinking someone's past caught up with them. Either hers or his. Hers, you mean? I mean the people after Klausia. Maybe the shot missed. Maybe it was meant for her. I like that. 
Been thinking the same thing myself. Mad dude. One of those mercenary buddies of his could have done it. They got guns, training, years of bad blood, probably. Or it could have been someone else from Cronell. Tell you what I'd do. Check out the coast for vantage points. Maybe consult with a ballistics buddy of mine. That's what I'd do. In a manner of speaking. Remember the two girls? He may be talking about the other one. That's right. It was her idea to hang him. I liked it. For political reasons. It sent a good message. The big guy turns to Glenn, who's about to say something. The blonde shuts his mouth before a word escapes. I'll see it again. All the Hardy Boys are right here, cop. That woman is just affiliated with the Hardy Boys. You don't know her, anyway. Nope. You're not getting to her. It's Klausia you want to talk to. You do that. Hey, cop. Before you go... Suddenly, the wind picks up outside. You hear it rattling the large windows in their frames. It carries newspapers, circles the whirling in rags in a warm column. She... Klausia came to Martinez to hide. Many of us did. This is where you wash up when there's nowhere left to go. The Union takes you in. Now... She refused that protection, but that's right. If we didn't take care of the people who end up here, this place would just be a couple of ruins and some cargo containers. We'll take that into account. Behind the dock workers, a ceiling height window. The hawthorn branches, nothing. Just black tangles like the hair of an old woman, motionless. Behind the dock workers, a ceiling height window, there's a yellow ribbon tied to one of the branches, light yellow, faded with time. A tiny splash of color in the blackness of the thicket, hanging from it, a bronze key. Someone hid the key in the bush and attached the yellow ribbon to make it easier to find. It's close enough to the latch up there. One can slide it open and just take it. Surely not a coincidence. Huh? I don't know about that. I'm comfortable here. Don't think any sliding would really help right now. Sorry, fucko. Looks like you're gonna have to go bush diving. Good fucking luck with that. I'm gonna enjoy the sight of you in the bushes out there. With a loud thud, the old man stands up, pushes the window open, grabs the key from the hawthorn branch and slides it across the table to you. The key is brass. Workshop spare is etched to its bow. The old man closes the window and sits back down in silence. Come on, man. We were just having some fun. Where's the harm in... I'm tired of listening to your shit. Don't thank me. I don't give two shits about your key. It could open the door in the kitchen. The blue door. It says workshop spare. Maybe there's a workshop there? It's worth a try. See, a heavy it could be connected to the barred door upstairs. The key fits the dimple lock. It takes a bit of effort to turn it after all these years. But then the lock clicks. The darkness before you smells like engine grease and cut wood. Who 
all these mesmerizing machines just waiting to be plugged back in and played. Feels like it might jump back to life any moment, the lights illuminating the white-robed woman. You can't fire them up. They are broken. Only that one machine in the main hall works. The Royalist Pinball. What a dumb name. Royalist Pinball. If they weren't broken, he would kick one of these machines about now. Kim Pinball Kitsuragi. Exactly. That's what he's known as. His reputation precedes him. What? So now he remembers. Fine, I'm Kim Pinball Kitsuragi, aka the Kimball. You remembered. Congratulations. No human being should. It is a game that requires no skill and a childlike affinity to flashing lights and to fantastic science fiction and historic romance franchise. It is lame. I am not called pinball. It was used to taunt me a long time ago, before I became a homicide detective and got my lieutenancy. Fine. I was a juvenile police officer for over 15 years. It's how I started out in the RCM. Once I had to infiltrate a pinball ring, as you do when you're a juvie cop. It was not okay. I needed to become a pinball champion. I trained for nine months. The job was successful and I was moved out of the juvenile wing to homicide. End of story. That time is over now. I was already a 38 year old man. It was unbecoming, as was playing pinball. It's best if you handle the juvenile delinquents. Lieutenant Kitsuragi is good too. Now we really need to continue our sweep of what appears to be a secret path through the whirling. Anti-object task force. Behold, the anti-object task force has assembled. God's avenging angel, arrayed against the lower emanations of the darkened one. Shoe racks, tape recorders, motor carriages, and doors. So many doors. You're not just pounding it all to pieces. You're reforging the universe, from the anvil of the heavens to the worms below. Indulge in it. Be bold. Have an impact on the shape of creation out of the furnace of your rage, a new reality. Also, you should trash your room again. This small elevator is dimly lit by a bulb that's been glowing for ages. The latticed cage is open, inviting you to step inside. Smells of nougat and sweat. Your head brushes up against the ceiling. There is a control panel to your right and just enough room for two people to fit in. The maintenance card under the control panel reads, Last Maintenance, 10th July, 88. So this is where they brought 40 pinball machines to fix them up, a long time ago. Everything is covered with dust now. The lieutenant looks around the dusty, crowded room, inspecting the tools on the shelf. At some point, 20 years ago, 15 maybe, before pinball went out of vogue. Looks like it. I'm guessing Martinez North 22 used to be a pinball arcade before it became a hostel. There are machines left over. A creak. Some dust falls off a shelf. Downstairs in the hall, next to the main door. One of them even- Remember the dice maker? Then that means... 
Ah yes, as the novelty dice maker said, this has absolutely nothing to do with the case, I'm sure. But I do like a nice little connection. If that's true, then our cafeteria manager is not going to like it. We should tell him what we found up here, omitting that suspicion. He does not appear to be the kind of man who likes his establishment to be part of a neighborhood ghost story about bankruptcy. Stupid superstition. Rigorous self-critique. Here it is. Hard facts from the man you are. You once jerked off in the locker room and were caught. You held a young woman by the arm and kept her in your apartment for 20 minutes against her will. That's right. These are not flights of fancy. These are real deeds, Harry, emerging from the darkness of your past. You tried shooting a fleeing suspect in the foot but hit him in the pelvis, crippling him for life. And, above all, you let life defeat you. All the gifts your parents gave you, all the love and patience of your friends, you drowned in a neurotoxin. You let misery win, and it will keep on winning till you die, or overcome it. You clearly see footprints in the downy carpet of dust covering the workshop floor. Jackpot. These, unlike everything else here, are new. Large prints, most likely made by boots. The size is hard to determine. Soul could be bigger than vamp. The soles have left the pattern, uniform, horizontal lines. One person has been here. They've gone back and forth. The tips point both ways. This print is unlike one left by a regular worker boot. It is not a brand sole with logos on it. It seems custom made or old fashioned. The size looks about the same actually. They are not the same shoe, but they could be the same person. No, these little horizontal lines are different. They look custom made to me. Or some kind of foreign print. Hard to say. Still a boot, though. Between that and that. Everything around you is quiet. Three weeks maximum, from the dust coverage. It could easily have been one week, too. You know, officer, the blue door was a mega investigation after all. It has now converged with our main investigation, which I would say is quite large. It means someone snuck through what seemed like a secret route, behind Classius' room, in the recent weeks. This may prove to be significant. You can almost see the shape of a man and a woman writhing inside, bathed in drug sweat and dirty linens. Bottles lie around everywhere. You can barely see through. Better not to jump to sensationalist conclusions here. The footprints on the floor. You can barely. The footprints on the floor, however. You lean closer to the peephole instinctively. I bet they're doing something quite unnatural there. Sensationally unnatural. This is the inside of the barred door you've seen before. Always good to see you. I understand. Just like that. No resistance. Her shoulders are slouched, her feet long and straight. I knew there was a chance you'd get them to tell you. It's what you do. You're the police. For what it's worth, I'm sorry for wasting your time. This is good. Clear the air first between you two. Then move on to questions. Is it? Something is off here. Shush, I can't hear what she's saying. If you knew we would find out eventually, why did you waste our time? Because of the Hardys. 
I couldn't just dispense with them. They were only trying to help me. You're right. There's more. You answer to the coalition government, and by extension, the moral intern. Briefly glancing over her shoulder to the sea, as she's done time and time again. A grand expanse of water reaches over the bay and to the horizon. Grey and pale violet in the morning light. The pale, the windy Isola, the Occident, and then Aranje, the old, old world. You share a database with them. You send people to their courts. I wish it did, but sadly no. Just business, but bad business for some people in the moral intern. If I show up in your records, officer, they will find me. They will... What happens if they do? They will kill me, sir. If you file my name, take me in for questioning, enter me into the moral intern mill, well, then I'm fucked. For nothing. This murder didn't have anything to do with me. Fucked. People after her. Moral intern, peep peep. This isn't Oranis lit. Actually, this murder did have a little to do with her. We were there. Together. In bed, I mean. Okay. He was in a kneeling position. He had just entered me. I was on my back, looking at him. I heard the window behind me shatter, and I turned to look. There was a hole in the glass. I turned back to him. His eyes were looking through me, and his mouth was open. Dumb. I could see. I could. A great pain moves through her. A dark and indefinite wave. She continues in spite of it. I knew he was dead. Before he fell down on top of me. He was heavy. I pushed him off and he fell to the floor. There. He only had his boots on. I bit the pillow, not to scream, then ran downstairs. I waited for the second shot to come. For me. I thought there would be one. It never came. She's forgotten about her cigarette. The butt has burned right down to her fingernails. Oh. So am I. What time was this? When did it happen? It would help us if you could be as precise as possible. 11.30 to 12.15. I don't know the exact time. Around midnight. It's okay. Were you inebriated? Not as much as usual. He'd done a line, plus other things. I was drinking. Wait. Titus said she was gurning her jaw off much more than usual. Oh, yeah. I did one of his lines, just to clear my head. Did you hear or see the shooter in the course of this? No. Nothing. I was trapped. I was stuck in my room downstairs. I got some clothes on and crawled back up, drew the blinds. Blood was coming from his mouth. Not a lot. Just a little. He was still on the floor, slouched. I couldn't be there with him anymore. So I ran down and out of my room, into the hallway, down the stairs. I knew there would be people there. Sylvie was tending the bar. A lot of people were there. The Hardys were at the table in front of the stage. I think the union box was full. Ruby was there too. They were having such a good time. I sat down and they all welcomed me. I didn't even have to say anything. Ruby knew something was wrong. Ruby. Ruby. You know, the leader. The leader? Of what? The Hardy Boys. Well, nominally, yes. Ruby's the one they go to when things happen, like things they need taken care of. She's the organizer. Well, Ruby said let's talk upstairs. I showed her the room. I've known these people since December. They know my situation, but I can't leave a paper trail. Ruby was the first one I told. She said she'd take care of this. It's what she does, you know, take care of things. I helped her get the body to the bathroom. We used a belt to pull him up under the shower to keep him upright. 
to mislead you, they were tampering with the body. To produce lividity, matching a hanging? Yes. We completely missed the tampering. Looks like you were there in time. What was this, 20 minutes after death? About 20, yes. Ruby explained it would make the blood... You know what it does. Ruby went outside to talk to Titus and the boys. I was just looking at Lely in the bathroom. I had to put his clothes back on. His armor, too. It was tough, but I've seen him take it off and put it on many times. It took Ruby maybe half an hour to come back with Titus. I'd gotten him ready by then. They carried him out. I knew what they were going to do. Make it look like a hanging. Ruby said they would. Ruby said to wait here. She also said I wouldn't see her for a while. That we should lay low or something. So I did. I don't know. I haven't seen her since. We will need to take this question to the Hardy Boys. Interesting. Why did this Ruby go through so much trouble to hide something someone else did? Look into this later. When he was shot? I may have. I don't know. I couldn't hear anything over the glass exploding. The gunshot wasn't that loud. This is something to keep in mind when assessing the distance of the shot. What? Why would I put myself through this insanity? Get myself cornered like this? He wouldn't have died if it weren't for me. I know that. But I would never hurt him. He was a serviceman. He must have had a gun. Somewhere, lying around. Close to her hand. No. I specifically asked him not to carry firearms when he was with me. He only had his stupid armor. Like what? Last week, Angus and Titus's brother, I think he's called Tibbs, took care of it. You should have another look at that window after this. Reconstruct the scene. It's right there. Yes, you see the glass sparkling out of the corner of your eye. Because I'm an idiot. Which is an indicator of truth. Idiot. She's nothing of the sort. You have to understand. The people around here. No one was making the call and he kept rotting. And then they picked his clothes off, and that little fucker threw stones at him. Her jaw is clenched. Her throat moves. It takes all her strength not to cave in and sob. Once. Just one time. He kept throwing stones at him for three days. I could hear the thud. Thud. So I called you. I hope with all my heart it's not the last thing I do in Ravishol. She definitely called the cops. That was task complete. It could not have been a lie. That is impossible. She nods silently. She doesn't even smoke. Just picks up the cold coffee and holds it in her hands. Um... He's thinking, are we done here? Or... Hello, officer. Who? What? Dear God, you've been lied to. She could have killed her lover and lied to everyone. She's not candid at all. She smoke and mirrors and willow wisps. She probably didn't give you her real name either. Why would she? Arrest her immediately before she further entangles you in her web of lies. There may be grounds here, at least for an extended detention. A little whimper. The young woman hears you. She's looking around. She slowly, slowly lights another cigarette and steadies her breath, as if in the presence of some tiger. 
You are. This is not the end of this.